I want to speak to you this morning about our unchanging God. We've been in this series, Getting to Know God. And you know how it is, living here in California in the year 2015, we are aware of constant, continual change. Have you noticed? Everything's changing. And the fact of the matter is that there have been scientific studies about this sort of thing. And too much change in a person's life creates stress in our lives. There's a writer named Alvin Toffler, and he is what is called a futurist. He writes on the topics of how, uh, how society is changing and what the digital age is doing and all of that sort of thing. But in this book that he wrote, he said that people are looking for points of stress and stability where they can find some security in their lives. Because when everything else is changing, people look for some stability. Oftentimes the wrong things, but they are looking. So the question then is, is there anything in this world that's permanent? Anything that is reliable? Hmm. Anything that never changes in this world? And the answer is actually in James, the first chapter, and the 17th verse. And here's what it says. Read it with me. Are you ready? Okay, okay. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. If you're following along in your outline, you need to circle. Who does not change. Philip's translation writes it this way. It says, with God, there is never the slightest variation or shadow of consistency. Inconsistency, I'm sorry. So, as we are on this series about God and what he's like, we're talking about the attributes of God. And so I want us to look at this, the unchangeableness of God. God never changes, never, ever changes. It says in Malachi, the third chapter, the sixth verse, I, the Lord, do not change. I don't really know how you could make it more clear than that. But that's what he says. He's always the same, always has been, always will be. Now, we, on the other hand, we do change, you know. Everything else in creation changes, except God. We change the way that we act. We change the way that we think. We change the way that we look, sometimes with greater, greater success than at other times, but that's what we do, okay? We change the way we talk. And talk and talk. Hmm. God never changes. Now here's the thing. Change creates stress in our lives. We have things that happen and it causes stress. For instance, we are not singing in the morning service the same music that we sang when I was growing up in the church. It's different music. There is a change. We now have a band. You know, you used to just have the piano and organ. We sing different songs. And would you believe me if I told you that those changes have caused some stress within the church? Would you believe that? Oh, yeah, you'd believe that. You'd believe that. Some of you caused some of the stress. That's right. Mm -hmm. There's changes in the church. There's changes in the music. There's changes in the traditions. So this morning I want to speak to you about how to stabilize your life in the midst of continual change. Stabilize it. There are ways to do it. God's Word has things to say about it. So we're going to focus on about three things that God, about God that never changes. Three things. And these things will add stability to your own life in the midst of continual change. Continual change. These are the things about God that you can always, always count on. Number one, 
Are you ready? Yes. Number one, God's love for me never changes. God's love for me never changes. I need to remind myself of that. You know, and we quoted that verse out there. Look at it here in Je Jeremiah 31, 3. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Circle those words. Everlasting love, God says. You have been created, as have I. You have been created to be loved by God, an object of God's love, an object of God's affection, consistent, continual. That's how God looks at you. He loves you. It never will change. I know it's kind of hard to get your head around sometimes because you don't love yourself all that much a lot of the time. But God's love for you is consistent. One of the reasons that we get frustrated in our relationships, you know, relations kind of come and go, you know. One of the reasons that we get frustrated is because people change. That's part of the problem. People are fickle. They like this, they don't like that. Mm -hmm. And they change, oftentimes from one day to the next, depending on what they're eating, depending on what's going on, they change. Sometimes women say, you're not the man I married. And he probably isn't. Some of you as parents, you've had the occasion to say, or if you don't, you will have, where you say, my sweet child has become this rebellious teenager thing. See? Just because people change. I don't even recognize them anymore. I've heard people say that. I've said that. I know how this is. They have become unpredictable. They have become inconsistent. It causes stress in your life. Hmm. Well, the Bible says that God always acts like himself. Always. He never changes. He never acts out of character. He is always who he is. It says in Psalms 119, 159, it says... Your love never changes, so save me, said the psalmist. The point is that I never, never need to doubt God's love. God's love for me never changes. Now, when you start having those doubts about whether God loves you, that is not coming from God. Where do you suppose that's coming from? It's coming from the enemy of your soul. Get you to doubt yourself. Get you to doubt God's love. But it says in Romans 8, 38, read it with me, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God. So, you can go to bed tonight, get up tomorrow morning, and God has not changed his mind about you while you were sleeping. He still loves you. God never has bad days. We get into trouble when we doubt God's love. We do indeed. When tragedy strikes us, as it will, or when we pray and we don't get any immediate answers, or when things don't go our way, which is a lot, we need to remember that God's love for you has not changed one bit. Now, that's a stabilizer in your life. That can be a stabilizer if you understand that God loves you the same, always the same. Number two. God's word never changes his word. We're talking about the Bible. See, the Bible laws and the Bible principles and the Bible commands about this, all of this, are timeless. It says, in Isaiah 40, verse 8, it says, read it with me. The grass withers and flowers fade, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now, this is California. We know the grass withers, and we know the flowers fade. But even so, the word of our God stands forever. The Bible is always, always is relevant, up to date, never obsolete, never dated. I get questioned about that all the time. You know, how do you know what to believe? Why does it say this? How come you have so many translations? On and on and on and on. 
But the fact is that you can base your life on the fact that God's word does not change. Language may change some. You know, those of you that can read Hebrew, that probably is a whole different thing to you. But for those of us reading English, you know, God's love and his Bible never changes. It's amazing, I find. It's amazing what people believe. I've heard a lot of them. Probably not scratch the surface. People believe strange things. Mainly it seems to be stuff that they have made up. See, and they believe it. But God's word tells us what belief does for us and tells us what faith can accomplish if we just give ourselves to it. Jesus said, he said this in Matthew, the 24th chapter, and the 35th verse. I want you to read this with me. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. What does that mean? It means that God's going to love you because that's what it says. Now, there never had been any book that has been more attacked, more criticized, more burned, outlawed than the Bible. The Bible has gone through all of that, is still going through it in major portions of the world today. But it still is true. All of those Caesars, you know, back there in the New Testament, and dictators and fanatics, all of them, they're dead. See, and the Bible continues, still around. Amen. His word never changes. Trust it. Even better, you might read it once in a while. It'll help you. Psalms 119, 152. Read this with me. Long ago I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. So I was reading this article about Alan Shepard. Any of you remember who Alan Shepard is? Huh? No. Uh, he was the first guy in space. That Alan Shepard, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so he was getting, he was just getting ready to get in the capsule. And then they were going to blast him out of the atmosphere to encircle the earth. And he was asked by a reporter just before he got into the capsule, what is the one thing you're depending on most in this space venture? The reporter asked him. And Alan Shepard said, I am depending on the fact that God's laws never change. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Being taken and placed in a, a container about the size of a porta potty and blasted into space, he was counting on the fact that God's laws were always true. I mean, what would it be like? What if gravity suddenly reversed itself? You see? When God made the universe, he established some universal laws. And they still work. They never change. They never will change. The reason that we can study science at all is because science is predictable. See, that's what it's based on. Completely predictable. Just as God has established the universe to operate on physical laws... There are moral and spiritual laws just as well. God has set them up. We cannot ignore them. Or if we do ignore them, we ignore them at our own peril. Contrary to popular opinion, which you hear forms of this, God does not invent new rules for every generation. Same old rules, see? Satan's temptation is always to get you to question God's word and say it doesn't apply now. First temptation that Eve heard was when Satan said to her, You're kidding, he said. Did God really say you couldn't eat of that fruit? Really? I mean, does that make any sense? That was the first temptation, see? Questioning God belittling it. Today, of course, Satan has put a little twist on this. The phrase that I hear over and over again is from people, well, they say, that's your interpretation. As though that made a difference, you see. I was sitting in a restaurant in Hong Kong. One of those up on the top of one of those buildings high up there. 
It's with a bunch of uh, with Chinese people. And uh, they found, they discovered, through the unceasing blather of my traveling companion, not my wife, <laughs> a friend of mine, and he told all of them that I was the pastor of a church. Well, they were immediately curious because they were all Buddhist or something. So they wanted to know, you know, what I believed, and I told them as best I could the gospel. I had to quit eating while I did it because I cannot use chopsticks and think at the same time. <laughs> you know. And I got all done. I said, well, that's, that's it. That's the gospel. And the response was exactly what this is here. Well, that's your, that's, that's your interpretation. I said, yes, of course it's my interpretation. Who did you, whose did you expect? But I tell you this, and I can tell you assuredly, it's true. Amen. Well, they weren't going to buy that. See? And I was glad that they didn't really believe me because it gave me a chance to eat. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's your interpretation, they say. You hear it all over Sacramento. You hear it all over college campuses. You hear it all the time. That's your interpretation. Nobody wants to know the truth. They want to know what they can do and how it can be justified. When you're driving in your car, you know, and you pull up to a stop sign, how do you interpret that stop sign? Do you put it up to a vote with the rest of them coming into the intersection? No, my understanding is that it says, stop! That's how I interpret that stop sign. God's laws are exactly like that. They're pretty simple, pretty obvious. How many ways can you interpret the word stop? The Bible says don't have sex outside of marriage. Oh, yeah, you want me to go back to the driving, don't you? <laughs> the Bible says don't have sex outside of marriage. So what do you suppose that means, that kind of statement, don't have sex outside of marriage? What does that mean? Well, let me explain it to you in case you haven't figured it out. It means do not have sex outside of marriage. That's what that means. You see? There's no footnote that says unless the other person is really, really cute. <laughs> or unless you have this really wonderful, emotional, deep feeling for the other person. It doesn't say that. It says don't have sex outside of marriage. Why does it say that? Well, because God knows that having sex is not as simple as the physical act. That's why. And you get drawn in and drawn down. Stop, it says. Matthew 7, 24. Read this with me. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You know the song, right? Wise man built his house. Crash! See that? Yeah. You know the song. Yeah. So here's how Jesus tells us to build a house. Way before the DIY network, see, he points this out to us. He says, there are two ways that you can build a house. You can build it on sand. That's the easy way. You flop down a two before and you start up. See? Or you can build it on rock. That's harder. For one thing, you start out with, you know, rocks. But that's, he said, there's one of those two ways. And Jesus points out that if you build your house, your life, if you build it on sand, the whole structure, you can count on it. It will eventually collapse. You've got to have a stable, solid foundation for your life. If you build your life on a current fad, if you build your life on therapy, whatever is being read on the internet, what you learn in Facebook, then you're building on shifting sands. And you're going to have an unstable life 
when the changes of life come. You've got to have stability in your life when the stresses of life come into your life. You've got to build it on something that never changes. God's love for me never changes, and God's word never changes. So the point is, if I want to have stability in my life, stability comes from building my life on God's unchangeable word. Just believe it. Build my life on something that will never, never change. It will consistently be true. Ten years, fifty years, a thousand years from now. So, here are some secret stress stabilizers. This is the main one right here. The secret stress stabilizer is memorize scripture verses from the Bible. Oh, man. Yeah, that's it. Memorize scripture verses from the book. Fill your mind with things that never change so that when you need them, God will bring them to mind. You have that resource built into your thinking. If you're wondering what to do in a particular situation, God will suddenly bring that verse right up to the front of your mind, to the surface of your thinking. If you want stability in your life, you've got to base it on the things that do not change. It says in Isaiah 14, 24, read this with me. It says, the Lord Almighty has sworn, you have it? No? God's purpose, I'm sorry, I skipped that. God's purpose for my life never changes. Isaiah 14, 24, there we go. Have you got it? I know it's not easy. That, that, we do this on purpose so that it keeps you alert. <laughs> All together. The Lord Almighty has sworn Surely as I have planned it, so it will be. And as I have purposed, so it will stand. So we ask the question as we look at the news. On and on. What, in, what is the world coming to? You ever ask yourself that? What is the world coming to? Well, let me tell you what it's coming to. It is coming to the very climax that God has planned from the very beginning. That's what it's coming to. It's still under God's direction. Now, I'm not sure what all that involves. I'm not sure. See, I don't have the details. But I do know that I don't know that all, I do not know that I don't know, <laughs> you get, you following me here? <laughs> that I don't know what the future holds, okay? But I do know who holds the future. Amen. The Bible says, Nobody knows, not even the Son of Man doesn't know, only the Father which is in heaven. So, when you're listening to the radio, that preacher or whoever it is, see, and someone comes up and they give you the exact date that the world will end, you know, you can bank on the fact that that's not the date. Because he's already told us nobody knows, and if they're on the radio saying that they know, they're wrong. Hmm. The Bible says... No man knows the day or the hour. There is this, though. This is the good news. Whenever that date may be, we are on the winning side. Amen. See, that's the good news. We are on the winning side. Doesn't so much matter when. Just decides which side are you on when this happens. It says in Psalms 33, 11, His plans endure forever. His purposes last eternally. 1 Samuel 15, 29. God is not a man. He does not change his mind. It says in Habakkuk 3, 6. His ways are eternal. Hmm. Yeah. That means that no matter what happens in your life, you're still on plan A that God has. God does not have a plan B for you. He has a plan A. God has not changed his mind. God's purpose for your life has not changed. What is God's plan for my life? You ever ask yourself that? Sure you have. What is that? Well, it tells us in John 10th chapter and the 10th verse. Do we have it? Yeah, we do. <laughs> Read it with me. I have come that you might have 
life. Life that you can live. Not just exist, but life with a purpose. Life with a completeness. Life in abundance. That's what he's promising us. And it tells us then in Romans 8, 29, it says, God's plan for your life is to become like Jesus Christ. What does God want out of me? What he wants out of us is for us to become like Jesus Christ. Christ. We put it so far out there. We put it so far away. The enemy of our soul comes along and says, well, you're, you're never going to do that. And we believe him. And it is not true because it is God's plan for our life that we become like his son. It all begins with relationship. It says in Romans 10, 8, read this with me. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Oh, yeah. Not, it doesn't say you have to roll on the floor. It doesn't say you have to do anything. He says this is what you have to do. You have to believe these things, and you will be saved. Something else that has never changed in God's plan of salvation. For 2,000 years, you know, there is only one way to get to know God, and that's through Jesus Christ, his son. That's been the plan for the last 2,000 years. It's still the plan today. In your life, between now and when you die, however long that is, I have confidence in you, you will experience a lot of stressful changes in your life. The question is, how are you going to respond to those changes? Well, you can't actually prepare for them because they are unpredictable changes. You don't know what they're going to be. How are you going to handle them? What's going to be the source of stability in your life? Three things to remember when you're under stress. And they're based on the three things that we've just looked at. There are, these things are absolute facts. They become spiritual anchors. They become anchors for your soul in a changing world. Stabilizer number one. God will never stop loving me. God will never stop loving me. Never. He will not even love me less than he loved me before. I won't understand all that is going on, but no matter what he's doing, he's acting toward me in love. Sometimes those actions are painful, but they are motivated by love. That's a stabilizer. No matter what happens, he loves me. Stabilizer number two. God's word is always right. Always right. The advice that we have in the Bible, in God's word, that advice is the right thing to do. Even if it's unpopular, even if it's unpleasant, it is always the right thing to do. If you want to know what the right thing to do is, you look in the Bible, it'll tell you. Stabilizer number three. Are you still with me? Yes. We getting too many numbers here? Or are you getting lost? <laughs> Stabilizer number three. God's purpose for my life is bigger than my problems. God's purpose for my life is bigger than my problems. Problems cannot change God's purpose for your life. It has not changed God's purpose for your life. It will not change what he wants to do in your life. It's written in the 125th Psalm. Read it with me. Those who trust in the Lord are as steady as Mount Zion, unmoved by circumstance. Yeah. Unmoved by any circumstances. Now that's what I call stability. That's mountain stability. Security, stability, confidence, it comes from being anchored in an unchanging God. When everything around us is changing, in this throwaway society that we have here where nothing remains the same and nothing could even be fixed, you know, there is one thing that ever changes. And that's God and these aspects of his life. So here's my question for you this morning. Okay? The question is, how you doing? 
Okay. All right. Good. Good. Are you feeling stressed because of some of the changes that are going on in your life? Feel about that? Okay. Life been a little hectic lately? Uncertain about your future? No. One no. <laughs> Here's the thing. There is a rock solid foundation for you to build your life on. And so I invite you right now, I invite you to pray three things. They are these. First, I want you to pray that, God, I believe you love me. And then I want you to pray, I accept your love gift of your son, Jesus. And third, Father, I commit myself to learning and obeying your unchanging word. I want to follow the advice of your word. Even when it seems hard or even when it seems unpopular because I know it's the right thing to do. Let's bow our heads, okay? And you may want to pray this as we have been praying here for the last. Dear God, I want to commit myself to cooperating with your plan for my life. I want to commit myself to that. Help me to learn from the mistakes that I've made. Please forgive my sins. I want to do what's right in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Change. Yeah. All right. We're going to have the presentation of your tithe and the giving of your offerings at this time. We'll